What is up, everybody? Welcome to the FanDuel Fantasy Q&A for Thursday Night Football for Week 13. I kind of use this bit a lot, but I'm going to be the first to say I can't believe it's Week 13. Uh, it feels like the season has flew by. But we got a pretty intriguing game uh, to kick off the weekend tonight with the Dallas Cowboys at the New Orleans Saints. Dome game, that's always good for fantasy points over under 46. According to FanDuel Sportsbook, spread six and a half in favor of the road Cowboys. Of course, we have starting quarterback news uh, with Taysom Hill starting for the Saints. His salary is a little bit low on FanDuel, so we'll talk about how that impacts single game slate strategy for tonight's matchup. But as always, this is a Q&A. So get those questions ready for the YouTube, Twitch Twitter, whatever, Facebook, whatever, whatever your uh, platform of choice is. Get those questions ready. Get those in uh, and we will break down this game, but we can also break down this weekend. I get a lot of start sit questions during this show, which I usually try to get to. Of course, I'm focusing primarily on single game strategy for the Thursday night game, but I will recommend that everyone goes to numberfire.com. And checks out my start sit column, which is a little not a little bit of a non-traditional start sit column. It it shows basically every player you would consider in a 12-team league and their their probability through thousands of slate simulations based in number fires projections that they finish as relevant fantasy assets. So for quarterbacks, tight ends, it's top 12 weeks uh, for running back and receiver, it's top 24 weeks. So I, I always point people to that because it can really help you contextualize the odds and the probability and really how close certain things are between the the players you're, you're trying to figure out whether you should start or sit. Usually it's pretty close. Um, and if you look at rankings, it, it can be hard to gauge that. So um, that's one of my favorite pieces that I do over at number fire, but you can also check out the full DFS uh, slate preview a podcast that I do with Jim Sonis called The Heat Check. We do that every Thursday. Then we recap the slate every Monday. We went through a lot of relevant trends for this week, key injuries and how that's impacting us uh, and, our, and our view of the slate. I talked about the probability that certain players, um, certain receivers at low salaries actually have big games from a DFS standpoint. So it's not all just your your straight up picks um, with, with no... Uh, no sort of deeper analysis. I think a lot of times that that uh, when I look back, I'm most impressed by like the the trends that we dig into, and, and I go through uh, the the low salaried receivers and how that impacts the slate for this week because we have running back value, uh, but we have stud running backs with Jonathan Taylor and Joe Mixon. Uh, but whether whether the value at receiver is viable or not is a different question. So again, get those questions in. And I'm going to start by breaking down, as I always do, this slate from a top-down perspective. And again, uh, feel free to throw me those start-set questions, but if you have specifics on this game, those are much preferred because it's a lot easier to answer specifics than it is uh, to go through plays you know, one by one, just kind of whatever I see for tonight. Speaking of that top-down view, I like to start with uh, passing, rushing, and receiving defense uh, numbers for each side in the game that we are featuring. Uh, we have the Dallas defense rating out as a top six unit in terms of passing net expected points per drop back allowed to opposing quarterbacks, their top 10 in success rate. So the success rate number being top 10 really implies that they don't allow really consistent gains and adjusted for quarterback opponents. They've been pretty good. Uh, from an adjusted fantasy point per drop back standpoint, the Saints a little bit more of a mid-level defense in terms of stopping the pass. Where their strength is, is right here against running backs. This is something that the Saints have been pretty good at um, all season. Obviously, they're they're just outliers in this sense. Um, and, and, you know, usually when you see a massively negative rushing net expected points per carry number, you can say, OK, maybe they had some fumbles. Maybe they're a little bit overrated from that standpoint, but with the rushing success rate being so low, you know that it's it's really hard to, to, to churn out consistent gains against this defense on the ground. So that could push the Cowboys to a little bit more of a pass-heavy script, and they're already pretty pass-heavy 
ranking 13th in pass rate in the NFL. Um, looking at their basically non-garbage time plays, ruling out when their pre-snap win probability is below 20%, above 80%. They are super fast, and they like to throw the ball. Injected in this matchup, Dak Prescott should have plenty of passing volume. Um, that might not necessarily funnel to the running backs for the Cowboys with Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard because Saints just kind of put the clamps down on running backs in general. Of course, from a rushing standpoint, but also specifically from a receiving standpoint. Uh, and then we have pretty beatable matchups here as far as the wide receivers go. Uh, both teams outside the top 20 in player level adjusted FanDuel points per target allowed to receivers. Uh, the Saints, pretty stingy um, against tight ends. Also, I misspoke. Uh, Dallas puts the clamps down on, on running backs out of the backfield. Um, the Saints are a little bit more susceptible, so that would lead to potentially a little bit more Tony Pollard action out of the backfield. So that's my bad. Um, lots of numbers to look at here. Um, but also, we see that the Saints t pretty typically an up-tempo offense. Um, and we would expect that this pass rate number to stay pretty low with Taysom Hill. That's what we saw with him last year in his starts. He did average over 200 passing yards per game, um, about 10 carries a game, 50 rushing yards per contest. It's pretty much what we should expect here. Um, for, for the Saints to keep this one close, most likely we're looking at Taysom Hill uh, to run the ball for this team to keep the ball on the ground. With no Alvin Kamara, it's going to go through Mark Ingram primarily. Uh, but that's kind of the recipe for the Saints for tonight. Digging into some optimal lineup trends based on comparable games in my database. This goes back to 2019, looking at games with totals of 44 to 48 spreads of about, you know, four and a half to eight and a half. So about those middling spreads. It's kind of what we get tonight. Um, that's decent, right? Like that's a decent spread, but it's also not blowout potential, at least from a spread perspective. In these games, we see that quarterbacks typically end up as the MVP more frequently than they do in overall games because the total is still high enough for quarterbacks to generate production, but not so high that we're seeing tons of production from the flex level players, the flex position players. Um, so we see that the quarterbacks outperform expectation by about six percentage points. Running backs in these game scripts have actually underperformed overall. Um, tight ends still always low. Uh, I don't think we really have a tight end viable MVP option for tonight. And then receivers dip down a little bit. Again, kind of going back to the fact that you need really high over-unders uh, for wide receivers to have blow-up games overall. The total is decent. It's not bad, but it's also not 50-plus. Um, that's usually whenever we can see receivers uh, really go off. As far as MVP splits, we see that... The MVP in similar games to this one comes from the favorite in about 65% of these lineups. That's up from 59% in the overall split. And of course, the most common, the most likely MVP in comparable games to this is the favorite quarterback, which puts us primarily on Dak Prescott, which shouldn't be surprising. And he does rate out top in my simulations, which I'll get to in just one second. Uh, but notably, whenever the MVP does come from an underdog, in these games, it still is like a wide receiver. I don't know if you got to be pretty contrarian to go with Traquan Smith or Marquez Callaway at your MVP. Very easily could could pay off because we have such obvious MVP options that don't include the Saints receivers. Um, but that's kind of one angle, depending on how how out there you'd like to get. Uh, with your game theory. And then as always, kickers about the same in this split, because realistically, this is about a, a down the barrel type of game, middling spread, middling over under. It's pretty comparable to a lot of games and kickers um, in, in the overall split, about 34% likely to make it into the, the optimal lineup and about 34% likely in these games as well. All right. I'm going to jump into some questions. Most likely, if they're about the single game, I will show. Well, I'll show you guys my simulations anyway for tonight, but let's just see. Let's get caught up here. A question from Josh on Facebook Should I bench Wilson and Metcalf? So 
not saying this to promote my own work, but this is a perfect example of why I like the start sit column that I do on number fire. Again, you can just go to numberfire.com and find it uh, should be featured toward the top of that page. But the question is who are your alternatives? And that's the crux of the start sit piece. Uh, but it'll show you uh, the, the, frequency that Russell Wilson is a top 12 quarterback. And it just depends on who you have available and if they are much more likely or even remotely more likely uh, to finish as a top 12 passer than Russ, then you can really decide from there. As for Metcalf, I mean, I'm not going to just say check out my article, but Metcalf, I'm a little bit worried about. His target shares have been pretty bleak um, the past few weeks. The results haven't been there. I don't know if he's banged up. Um, but they've been going to Tyler Lockett more. That connection's been back before the Russ and DK Metcalf connection has been. So, um, again, it's hard to say to bench DK Metcalf at all, but uh, he's th- he still rates out as a pretty solid uh, play overall, according to the slate simulations that I run to, to generate the start sit column. But I would say check that out and see who your options are, who might be available on the waiver wire, who's on your bench, and compare DK's odds uh, to theirs. Question from Grim Fan Gallup's value tonight is Cooper playing. So, yeah, uh, all three of the top receivers for the Cowboys are going to be um, active. It's the third time all season, week one and like week nine, I think, when they played the Falcons, whatever week that was. Um, and I have some notes on the usage among those top three receivers, but as far as actual value goes for Gallup, he's fine. Um, the salary of 10500 it's not too high. It's not too low. Um, it, it, it It's fine. I think that he's a pretty clear number three, which is not like a hot take, but I'll get to those numbers here. Um, and the, in the two games that all three receivers have played, and they haven't really played full games in either of those with Gallup leaving early, it's just kind of a messy situation. CD Lamb leads the Cowboys with a 24% target share. Cooper's at 22%, so close, but you know a little bit behind. And then Michael Gallup's down at 13%. So that makes him sound like a distant third. And while I, I still would rank him third regardless, here's one number that I think is at least impressive for Gallup's potential tonight. Because we're looking at such small samples, rather than divide targets by game, um, we can divide it by routes run. And in that context, Lamb leads that trio with 32%. So he's got a target on 32% of his routes in these games that these guys shared. Cooper's at 23%. Gallup's at 21%. So the gap between Gallup and Cooper, not that massive. CD Lamb, easily the best overall process play of the three, especially because he has the, the balance of downfield work and volume that Amari Cooper doesn't quite have as much of. Uh, But for me, it's going to go Lamb, Cooper, Gallup. But Gallup definitely, even though he rates out as a mid-level value, which I know is the question, Grim fan, um, still a very worthwhile uh, play, especially if you're playing Dak Prescott at MVP. Um, Okay, question from Ryan. Should I start Dallas D or no because of Taysom Hill? Again, that depends on your... Uh, your alternatives, you can check out the projections on number fire to look at uh, alternatives. I, you know, Taysom Hill, he's been charged with some turnover worthy plays according to pro football focus this year. He was below league average in per drop back passing that expected points last year. He was at a point Oh six in his starts league average about a point. I mean, this year it's a point one Oh last year was a little bit higher, but about a point one two. So about half as efficient Definitely nothing to, to worry about defensively, but you might have better options. Um, although, you know, with the if you if you play the angle that, you know, Dallas plays from ahead, forces Taysom Hill to have to throw, we know that that could lead to good things. So I'm kind of like lukewarm on the Dallas defense for tonight. Probably do a little bit better, but um, that's whenever I – and defense is – I don't really do a whole lot of analysis on myself, so that's why I let uh, number fire do the work for me on those um okay josh is asking out of the out of these three i need two gronk Pitts, knox need two so i'm gonna okay i'll 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 run this through my start set simulator but i doubt it's going to be dawson knox here 
uh, between those. I love Rob Gronkowski this week. He, I know he had the production this past week, but he also had just a phenomenal role. So I'll see what I'll see what uh, the simulations here have to say. So yeah, and I'm I live, I'm leaving it at a half PPR because I don't you didn't specify, but that's you know it's fine. Um, with the implied team total even being low for the the Falcons here, uh, it's it's kind of hard to make a case for Dawson Knox within that trio. Gronkowski again had a phenomenal workload. Kyle Pitts, the production hasn't been there, uh, but for Dawson Knox, he's still got a lot of competition for targets. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and play the safe route and go with Rob Gronkowski and Kyle Pitts out of those uh, three. Kyle on YouTube is asking Taysom Hill MVP. Great question. Yes and no. Um, it comes down to your risk tolerance uh, for MVP plays. Um, very obviously Taysom Hill at 7,000 on FanDuel rates out as like a slate busting median level value for tonight. Uh, but his top score odds, and this is all based on number fires projections. And then I simulate things out 10,000 times just to see what, what's the most likely outcome, how frequently certain players lead the slate in FanDuel points, how frequently are they, are they top five? Taysom Hill's third, barely. Let's call him second. I would probably bump this up a hair if I were uh, projecting him. I, I would, you know, bump up his his half, like his Fanduel points by about half a point, even one point, like sixteen and a half, seventeen here. But either way, um, what we're seeing is that Dak Prescott is still the best bet to lead the slate in Fanduel points, which shouldn't surprise anybody. And on Fanduel. With no, you know, everyone's the same salary regardless of whether you play them at flex or MVP. It's hard to go against Dak, especially with those historical optimal lineup numbers uh, showing that we want when we can and we can um, <laughs> the the favored quarterback in games like this. So that's the case against Taysom Hill. The case for Taysom Hill is just that he's a rushing quarterback, and rushing quarterbacks can bust open any slate again. He threw for over 200 yards in his four starts last year, um, averaged over, I don't want to say threw for over 400 and like, I don't want to apply each of them. Um, but you know, he, like he has that Konami code, uh, upside shout out to rich rebar on that one. But again, last year, 52.3 rushing yards per game in his starts with almost 10 carries. That's phenomenal. Um, I would say that if I were, really to project out popularity numbers at MVP, even with Taysom Hill being under salaried, he's not going to come close to Dak just because Dak is the favorite. He's got a higher implied team total. He's got a lot of stacking candidates. So there's still leverage there most likely with Taysom Hill at, at almost 20% odds to lead the slate in FanDuel points. Bigger question is like, do you stack him with anybody? Can you play him with Mark Ingram? There's probably a pretty severe negative correlation between he and Ingram just because Taysom Hill would derive so much of his value from rushing and specifically rushing touchdowns. Uh, but who do you stack him with? Like Traquan Smith's fine. He would be my number one uh, among their pass catchers between he, Callaway, um, and really anyone else. I mean, Lil Jordan Humphrey ran a few, like, ran a, like he can get a downfield target or two, but it's not really enough unless you're playing the angle that this game is extremely low scoring. So the question becomes, can you play Taysom Hill by himself at MVP with four Cowboys? I think that that's very possible to be the optimal lineup. Um, I think that it's really intriguing. So it's like a yes and no. Um, he's probably more likely to be the MVP than he'll be rostered as MVP. The question just becomes like, is there enough for him to produce if we don't have a, a viable stack candidate for him? So, I mean, again, I'm going to go with Dak number one because everything tells me to, but I still love Taysom Hill as the MVP and I have nothing against it uh, there. Um, Seth on YouTube is asking, should I start Gallup over Judy? Um, I'll run that through the Sims just because Judy's playing 
you know, I'll call it off the main slate, but the majority of my research at this point in the week is uh, through Thursday night and the main slate on FanDuel. But Judy, I mean, I, I want to love Jerry Judy, but the market shares for the Broncos have been like really, really frustrating. We've seen multiple games with, as they're getting healthier, we've seen multiple games from them where nobody's had more than four targets and that's an issue right now. Michael Gallup should be in line for pretty steady volume here, especially against a team that, that stifles the run. Um, but as expected with pretty, pretty even projections, it's, uh, it's about a coin flip here. Um, Judy is rating out a little bit more likely to get to 15 Fanduel points. He's rating out, a little bit more likely, or half PPR, I always call them fatal points, but half PPR points. Um, so he's like a little more likely than, than Michael Gallup. I kind of don't like such a low implied team total for, for the Broncos, though. Just 19 points. I'm. This is a tough one because it's so close, um, but I would lean Jerry Judy. Um, if I had to, I think that if I was staring at the same thing, I would lean Judy, uh, for myself in my own lineup. So I'm going to say Judy there. Um, Johnny on Facebook is asking not for the game tonight, start Jerry Judy, uh, or Van Jefferson against the Jaguars. I think I'm going to go Van. I don't care what these numbers say. Um, Van Jefferson was in a, a fantastic spot last week. He had four of 10 downfield targets for the Rams. Um, he had nine targets overall. Uh, just one shy of Odo Beckham and Cooper Cup uh, for a, a team high. Odo Beckham not practicing Wednesday, so he's not probably not a hundred percent. But like, here, okay, so here's the thing: this couldn't get any closer uh, in terms of projections, and also the, one of the reasons that uh, Jefferson is projected a little bit. Uh, lower here, but has has the ability to o- outcome uh, overperform. Sorry, um, Judy in a, a simulation model is because I account for ADOT and his ADOT is really high. Um, so is Judy's, but um, that that kind of explains why this is leaning a little bit toward Van. But the number that really is is dictating this is the implied team total. The touchdown equity for Van Jefferson is just substantially higher than it is for Jerry Judy, and I think that that's one thing that you can always look at whenever you have coin flip decisions is whose team is expected to score more. It's very clearly here by 11.25 points um, that it's going to be the Rams. So I love Van this week and I I feel pretty confident in the process behind starting Van Jefferson uh, over Jerry Judy. Um, Josh says Burrow's killing me. Yeah. He's had three straight down games. Um, I think that there's a good path for him to produce in a, in a promising game, I can actually just throw him in here and see what his odds are of getting to 20. But, you know, the, the Chargers do limit that they're good at defending the downfield pass. They still face a pretty decent uh, number of downfield attempts and, and like they're, they're like 20th and dot something like that. So they're really good at defending those. Um, but, They've also haven't faced Jamar Chase, and Jamar Chase is phenomenal. T. Higgins phenomenal on downfield targets as well. Um, you know, it's a pretty solid projection. Uh, four out of ten times he gets to twenty Fanduel points or fantasy points. Um, I, like I think that he's fine. It just depends on what your options are. And again, point you back to uh, the start sit column that I post on uh, Number Fire, so that you can compare uh, his his performance uh, outcome range compared to other starters. Uh, Brandon is asking, should my coworker Dustin make Gallup his MVP? Um, I mean, honestly, I think you could do worse than Michael Gallup at MVP. Um, I'm not going to get there. I, I can tell it's a bit of a joke, but um, you know, we still see a like a decent amount of MVPs be wide receivers. I think Michael Gallup is very underrated from a talent standpoint. And if you're willing to play Michael Gallup at MVP, you can build. So here's here's the thing. A lot of people are going to start their lineups uh, like this to some degree. And you have 12,167 for your final three plays on FanDuel. Um, 
this slate could easily come down to which of the five players you play in your MVP. Like you can, you can build a really chalky Dak plus Taysom lineup, or you could differentiate it very easily by plugging in Gallup at MVP, put Dak back at flex. So I know it's kind of a joke, but whenever we're looking at such an obvious slate with so much salary available because Taysom Hill is 7,000, I don't think it's really like that big of a joke uh, to play Michael Gallup at MVP in some lineups. If you're playing multiple lineups, um, Adam's asking uh, Chuba and Terry or David Montgomery and Hunter Renfro. Definitely not uh, the, the Chuba side there just because his role has been pretty bad. They've been um, relying a bit more on Amir Abdullah. Um, I, I think that Hunter Renfro is in a great spot long-term. The, the volume has been there, the downfield targets. He's got three downfield targets in the past three games. His A dot is like seven and a half over the past three games, which is still about three yards shy of the receiver average, but he's getting a little bit more downfield work. David Montgomery, uh, someone I actually kind of featured a little bit um, in the star set column. He's playing like 90% of the snaps for the Bears. Um, it, it's a really good role. So for me, that one's pretty clearly uh, going with the David Montgomery side. Um, DJ is asking, will Ingram see any work if Kamara is back? So Kamara's out. Um, play Foster Moreau with Waller out. Yeah. So Mark Ingram is set for a pretty big workload um, tonight. Kamara has been rolled out. I know that he's still listed as a game time decision on FanDuel just because I don't think it's totally official, but um, number of fires projecting this one without Alvin Kamara with Mark Ingram to play pretty heavy snaps. And he is the very, like, he's the easiest leverage play at MVP. If you plug him in, you are by default not able to play either quarterback at MVP. Again, you can still play Dak and Taysom in your lineup, but if you play Mark Ingram at MVP, that could be the difference between the same five player lineup uh winning a tournament and placing tied for like, you know, whatever just because just because Dak ended up actually being the MVP. And I know that sounds like play a make a suboptimal decision, but those little tweaks really add up um, in a single game format. Um, DJ asking thoughts on DeAndre Carter this weekend. Also just a heads up. Antonio Brown got suspended three games according to Bleacher Report. Um, okay. So I won't comment on the Antonio Brown situation, but that's good for Rob Gronkowski, Mike Evans, um, and Chris Godwin for sure. Tom Brady is one of my favorite quarterbacks for the main slate. Um, DeAndre Carter. Well, let me see what what we get here. Not a whole lot of love from Number Fire Simulations. Um, again, if it's like a start sit situation for a season long, I could probably do a little bit better. Um, I'm not there. Uh, even though I like this game, Jim Shaughnessy and I talked about uh, this game a good bit on the Heat Check previewing the main slate, but I really don't think that it's there. I also talk specifically about low salaried receivers and when sort of what context in which they hit their ceilings. So um, I would say probably no uh, for me with Carter. Um, Adam, I think is a follow-up. Uh, Chuba and Terry or Montgomery and Renfro. Chuba and Chuba or Montgomery. Um, if you could just, so if you could just trade Chuba for Montgomery, I would do that. I don't have a whole lot of interest in Chuba Hubbard and I love David Montgomery. If it takes subbing from Terry to Renfro, I, th I still think it's worth it um, just because Montgomery's role has been uh, so good. So sorry if I'm not understanding, but um, I would say Montgomery over Chuba, um, even if it takes uh, giving up that, that drop from Terry McLaurin to Hunter Renfro uh, for the rest of the way. Johnny's saying, yeah, Kamara's out. So thanks for that. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's all the questions uh, for tonight. I think it's a really fascinating slate because we have Taysom Hill, um, but it does, it's not going to take a whole lot of differentiating to still play Taysom Hill and be a little bit different. You can leave Salad on the table because you, we would be playing Taysom Hill at 14,000 anyway. So you could just kind of envision that. Um, the role is still the same. The salary is not. And that's the easiest way to get different for tonight. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for the questions. It's always helpful to get some 
uh, input here, some some things to go over for the Thursday night slate, but of course the uh, season long angle as well for the weekend. So thanks again for tuning in. That's going to be all I have for today's FanDuel Fantasy Q and A. Big thank you to Joy Affleck for producing the video here. Uh, best of luck tonight and best of luck this weekend.